between
so thankful that they could be here. And when Joe walked in the room, they were already here. If any of you missed that, it was a sight to uh, see Joe spotting and Bill and Jody. What did you say? <coughs> what did you say? What did you say? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing here? And then um, I'm so glad that my sister, June Knight, could come from Jackson, Mississippi, and her daughter, Cindy, and her husband, Bill Harrison. Thank you, Bill, for bringing these girls from Jackson, Mississippi. And then um, a friend of ours that used to be in the church 20 years ago, where'd he go? <laughs> Joe Bagley. Well, I, when he comes in, you know my neighbors, uh, Dr. Amrick and um, Shami Walia live. Uh, I look right out my front windows to the right up the hill at them. And then uh, my neighbors out on the garage side of my house, the Screvin, Cindy, and Jim, and their son Thomas, and the twins. Um, Anna and Mary. <laughs> you know why I hesitate? Because I never know which one I'm looking at, so I don't call their names. <laughs> they are identical twins. And this is Joe Bagley. Give him a hand. Because <laughs> Joe and Marilyn were in McElwain for a long time, and they had two girls the same age of Angie and Jody. And we loved them so much and had such wonderful times together. And then my neighbors, um, Jean and David Brown. Jean's mother is Edna Blythe in our church. And um, they are so good to me. Jean does so many wonderful things for me. Um, and then our friends from long ago who were at McElwain when we came, Pat and Jean Massey, do y'all see them right here? And get to know them if you don't already. And then Howard Hubbard, Howard and Rachel. And Rachel, say, but I, I hesitate to say any of them. Um, there was, there was, I called mother to, to tell about some of the stories that I wanted to tell, and you know, should I tell this? And, and she said, no, don't tell that. He tells that story all the time. <laughs> so, I, I, I know that of which she's, she was speaking. Um, there's a great saying that I like. It says, behind every great man is a woman rolling her eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and so behind Dad, there were always three women rolling their eyes. <laughs> and so as I drove down this afternoon, I, could th I started to think of um, all these things that happened and little stories, and I was going to try to tie those stories into um, how I turned out so well. <laughs> and the first, the first story, and I hope that I get all these right, I, I, I called Jody and I said, uh, what stories are you going to tell? And, and I want to make sure that we don't tell the same stories. And she said, well, I'm sure that you had a different slant on it anyway. So. <laughs> but there's a, when my dad, if you've known him for very long, whenever he sees small children, he wants to come at them and he is so um, excited and effusive around them that he um, he just beats the tar out of your little leg and your little behind. You know, he, he he just starts patting, you know, and it, it becomes very abusive. And that's the that's the the house that we grew up in. And my, my kids today say, why does Papa have to hit so hard? <laughs> but anyway, as a child, when he would come in at the end of the day, we knew that that's what we had to look forward to. Is that he would be so excited, you know, and he'd just start slapping, and we'd all it was it was quite hectic. So I. I remember one night, I think he had been, he was coming in from off the road, we hadn't seen him in several days, we knew he was going to be really excited, and so um, it was pouring rain, and um, we heard the car pull up in the driveway, and I remember immediately, I ran and got behind a chair or the sofa or something, and I was hiding behind the chair. And I remember um, peeking out from behind the chair when the front door flew open and my father just came falling into the living room. He just fell out in the floor and he was writhing in pain. And what had happened was 
he pulled up in the driveway in the pouring rain and he looks across the yard and he sees the newspaper laying out in the grass. And so he's going to make a stop, a detour, and get the newspaper before he gets up on the front porch. So he runs out in the rain and he grabs up the newspaper. And to get to the front porch, he decides we had some azalea bushes along across the front of the porch. And he decided, he said, I can take those azalea bushes. I can, I can get over those bushes. So he's going to leap the azalea bushes and get on the front porch, which, which would be a great idea, except that he always kept the front porch painted. He kept that concrete porch painted so that when it got wet, it was just as slick as glass. And he hit that front porch, and we had some little, those little wrought iron and ice cream parlor chairs, and he said he went through those chairs like a bowling ball. And that he hurt himself, and then he, you know, he got up, you know, and he stumbled into the house. But I just remember that, that image of being so, um, I don't know, so so frightened and so astonished to see your dad come flopping through the front door of the porch. And let's see, what, what has that done for me? That, that uh, I guess that I learned just how excited and enthusiastic my father is about me. Um, the second story that I have to tell is about one Sunday night at the Hubbard's house. And a lot of times on Sunday nights we would go to the Hubbard's house and we'd go to the McLean's house after church and we would all play and remember the kids would watch the Carol Burnett reruns. Bill's telling me to shut up. No, just um, move along. But I remember <laughs> Dad would always warn us and he would say, I don't want, say, he'd say the same thing every Sunday night, I don't want any running or romping or acting like wild Indians. <laughs> and then he, he would always give us so, some wise saying, and he'd say, and you can write that down in your little black book. <laughs> and it was always something obnoxious that we didn't want to write down. <laughs> so I remember at the end of the evening, we were all, you know, I know how that feeling is now of trying to get your kids together and get them in the car, and the adults kind of tend to want to keep talking after they've told the kids to get in the car. And so we had gotten loud and obnoxious and I remember it was a, it was dark but I remember being loud with somebody Gina or Meg or somebody and turning and looking this way and I see my father coming at me and he's in the process of taking off his belt and, and just that sense of self-preservation I took off running in this direction and I got halfway down your driveway and I realized my chances are better if I just stop and take it than if I make him have to chase me down. So I remember just stopping and turning around and I got it right there in the driveway. And I guess my, what I learned there was you better obey your father. Um, Dad was always um, playing mean tricks on us. And I remember the happy day when he came home and announced that he had bought a bird dog. You don't remember that? And we were so excited because we loved animals and we always wanted a, a new pet. And he had bought a bird dog. Well, where is it? It's out in the van. We went out there and looked, and a bird dog is a um, radar detector. <laughs> and he thought, that was, he thought that was so funny that he'd gotten us going so good. And that taught me that my dad is always concerned for my safety. <laughs> And then, I know y'all remember this, remember El Chico's restaurant here in town? There was a Mexican restaurant, El Chico's, and Dad loved to go to El Chico's. We went there all the time, it seemed like. And so finally, along about high school or so, he, we were going out to eat one night. Where do you want to go? Well, I don't want to go to El Chico's. Well, why not? Oh, they've changed their cheese. And, that was, and we always, after that, he'd have some reason for why he didn't want to shop somewhere or go somewhere or drive somewhere or eat somewhere. It would just be some reason that we just thought was bizarre, like not though they changed their cheese. <laughs> and I, from that I learned that my father only wants the best for us. We don't eat inferior cheese. <laughs> and then the last story that I will tell is about the fact that my father, um, a closed door means nothing to him. There is no closed door that, that he cannot get through. And so when you, when you visited his home, when you grew up in his home, you had to make sure that if you went in the bathroom, you had to make sure the door was locked because, you know, he might come in and find you incapacitated and you just, you know, you couldn't get away from him. And so, <laughs> We always have to be very careful about closing the doors and locking the doors. And um, I recall that on the day Fern was born, 
I had been on the delivery table all day long, and they had come up from Birmingham, and they had been there a long time waiting. And I think they got tired of waiting, and they left the room to go get something to eat. And while they were gone, the doctor came in and said, well, we're just going just gonna to start pushing and see if we can't make something happen. And so there I am in that position that you have to get into <laughs> to have a baby. And um, the doctors in their sterile gowns, the lights are shining, the nurses are saying, push, 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 push. And uh, the curtain flings open. <laughs> and there's my dad. <laughs> And, and, I, and I just learned that, like, like God, you, there's, you cannot get far from the long arm of Job. <laughs> that made me have to have the baby right away. <laughs> No, I turned to my husband and I said, get him out of here. <laughs> and I did nothing. <laughs> but I've, I've had, I have been very blessed to have the father that I've had. And I was singing the other day, I am 40 years old and I've never driven a car that my daddy didn't buy for me. <laughs> and I, I think that's sweet, but really it's kind of pitiful. <laughs> I recognize that. But I, I love him to live to be 100 and we'll be doing this again in 10 years. <laughs> I'll save some money. Not sentimental like him. <laughs> well, you should feel honored because women made such an effort to come tonight, Charlene. We, we are so glad. We hope that you continue to improve. Have any of you thought of anything else? Um, I, some of you may not have heard that Bernard had an, uh, a fall yesterday. Let's see, Sue, do you need to, do you know anything oh, new? Bob and I went by this afternoon. It sounded like Tara being his child, but it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Like <laughs> um, I thought about um, a passage of scripture that um, you all know in Proverbs about the virtuous woman. And you know what the last verse of that says? It says, um, charm is deceitful <laughs> and beauty is passing, but the woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. And I thought about that. Charm is deceitful. I've been very charming for the last few months as I planned this party. But um, unless anybody has thought of anything they want to say, um, I will. We'll have a benediction. Charlene, you want to come up? No, thank you. I just wanted to say there aren't many things that can get us out especially on a night like this, but this is one thing that we had, we had to see Joe Arnold turn 70. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it'll probably be about midnight tonight when it actually happens, but... <laughs> and you know this week he walked from our house to Baptist Hospital and back, and, and then he's been hauling stones out of the creek. I mean, it, it would take a... Man. A caveman to do what he's been doing. He's going down to the creek and hauling up rocks to build a patio. And he just nearly killed himself, but maybe he's trying to run from that 70. Uh. <laughs> this is deteriorating to a bad situation. Uh, I would like to thank all of you, our neighbors and friends and relatives. Uh, this has been a, it was a complete surprise. Uh, I didn't even suspect anything. But then uh, I do realize that I'm paying for all of this. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> and you helped so much. Um, for our benediction tonight, um, I've loved Psalm 115. I like the first verse because it says, not to us, O Lord, but to you goes all the glory for your faithful, enduring love. 
And so that's the way we feel being able to celebrate tonight. It's to the Lord that the glory goes. But then verses 14 and 15 say, let's see if I can remember what it says. Um, May the Lord richly bless you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. And that's my prayer for you tonight. Thank you. I just changed it. Is it hey? Oh, good. That was great, dude.